there were headlines this week about critical comments Makai Becton made about the Jets coaching staff. However, the Jets still need Becton, and he still needs the Jets, and I'll explain why on today's episode of the Locked On Jets podcast. You are Locked On Jets, your daily New York Jets podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome, this is the Locked On Jets podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. It's Wednesday, May 24th, 2023, and I'm your host, John B. from GangGreenNation.com. Thanking you for making the show your first listen or first watch every day. Subscribe to the show for free on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts so that you'll get new episodes as soon as they're posted. If you're listening to the show on a podcast source, please give it a five-star review. And if you're watching on YouTube, give this episode a big thumbs up. These things help us out and help other Jets fans find Locked On Jets. Today we have our weekly mailbag show. Thanks to everybody who sent in questions. Each Wednesday we try and do a mailbag with listener questions. We begin with a question about Mekhi Becton. If the relationship between Mekhi Becton and the Jets is fractured to the point where it's all but guaranteed that he's going to walk in free agency next year, what do you think the Jets will do? Do you think he'll be traded during training camp? Do you think he'll be traded at the deadline? Do you think he could get franchise tagged and then traded next offseason? What or who could they target in the return in any trade? It's an interesting question. So you have to go back to Monday where there was a story that came out in Newsday. It was a pretty wide-ranging interview with Makai Becton, but the big headlines were comments Becton made that were pretty critical of the Jets coaching staff, particularly how he was handled a year ago. Now, a year ago, he was coming off a very serious injury that he suffered in 2021, and he suffered another serious injury in training camp, and he was critical of the Jets' coaching staff for putting him at right tackle because prior to that he had played left tackle. He said that it put too much stress on his knee that he was re- recovering from. He said that they made him play hurt, and that led to an injury. And then he was asked about his relationship with the current coaching staff, and he said, it is what it is. So pretty candid comments from Mekhi Becton. You know, it's easy to say in situations like this. Sometimes things are kind of blown out of proportion, this case, the player was pretty critical of his coaching staff. I mean, that's a it's not a surprise this generated headlines. That's a pretty big story. But I don't know that Becton's going to be traded because I don't think the Jets have the luxury of trading Becton right now. Now, you get the feeling that the coaching staff does not love Becton. In fact, you, I got that feeling a year ago because they were so quick to move him from left tackle to right tackle for George Fant. So it kind of signaled to me something wasn't exactly right. But it's kind of you're you're at a point of the year where it's very difficult to make a move, especially at the tackle position, because the tackle position is really important in the NFL. And if Becton had made these comments, I don't know, in February or March, then I think there's a very plausible chance he could have been traded at that point, because there's a way for the Jets to replace him. There's no way for the Jets to find a new starting tackle right now. I guess you could say they could go with Billy Turner, but I think you want Becton in the starting lineup, and I think you want Turner as a backup, where they could you know, make a move. You know, One of the things I've talked about over the last couple of days is how maybe Joe Tipman steps into the starting lineup and Elijah Vera Tucker moves to tackle. But I think for the Jets, the offensive line that has the most upside for you involves Becton playing tackle and playing well. It's really the scenario of the Jets. The Jets have a lot riding on Becton playing well this year. That's just the situation that they find themselves in. So I go back to what I said back in October last year when Elijah Moore demanded a trade. My views on it were pretty simple. At that point in time, the Jets needed Elijah Moore. There was nothing the Jets could do at that point. They could not trade Elijah Moore because they did not have the luxury, and they were 5-2 and two at that point. They did not have the luxury of trading a starting receiver. There was no way to replace him. And the caveat that I threw out there was the offseason things may change. And sure enough, in the offseason, things did change because the Jets had ways to add other receivers. They had a chance to restructure their receiver room in the way that they wanted to. So at that point, that's when they dealt Elijah Moore to the Cleveland Browns. But they could not do it in October because they would have been down a starting receiver. The Jets needed Elijah Moore. They needed him to produce. And unfortunately, he really did not. So I find, I think the Jets are kind of in the same situation right now because if you're looking at most important players on this roster this year, Mekhi Becton rates pretty high, and I think that 
If the Jets were in a different situation, you may remember three years ago, of course, they traded Jamal Adams before the start of the season, and they got a couple first-round picks and a third-round pick for him. But that was early in Joe Douglas's tenure, and that was not a team that was really going anywhere anyway. This is a team with Aaron Rodgers under center, a 39-year-old quarterback. This is a team without a first-round pick next year. This is a team that's pushed a lot of future cap space, a lot of cap space from this year to the future. This is a team that has to make it happen right now. So you can't really trade Becton right now because you need him. You need to win. You need to make it happen this year. You, you can't, you know, you, you don't have, you're not in the same situation you were back in 2020. Jets need Becton. They need him to play very well for him, for them this year. So I don't think that there's any way they can look to trade Becton. The other aspect of this is if you look at what Becton's capable of doing, now we don't know whether he can do it, but if you look at what he's capable of doing, at least if you go back to his rookie year, and it's, you know it was a long time ago, it was that 2020 season, so it's two full seasons, three calendar years. He did look like a guy who could start in this league. So you know that you somewhere in him, you know, as long as he hasn't lost that much athletic ability, you've got a guy who could play well. You got a guy who could potentially be a starter, but you don't have a guy who's got a lot of trade value because I don't know the team's going to trade a lot for somebody who hasn't played in two years and is going to be a free agent after the season. I think for everybody, what needs to happen is Becton needs to play this out. And hopefully, I think the best case scenario for both the Jets and for Makai Becton is that he plays well. And you know something? At the end of the year, you deal with it then. And you know maybe it's a franchise tag type situation. Maybe they work things out. You know, everybody always assumes that just when a player and a team are unhappy with each other, that that means it's the end. It's not always the case. You know, some sometimes you, you reach an understanding. I mean, this Quinn and Williams situation, there's a lot of unhappiness now from Quinn and Williams aside. That's all going to be resolved. Everybody's going to be much happier with with the whole Quinn and Williams situation if the two sides can work out a deal. Then it will be like none of this ever happened. So things can change. One of the things about the NFL is that these situations could change very quickly and it can happen rapidly. If Becton goes out and has a great season, and the coaching staff's impressed with him and they, the front office is impressed with him, he could end up with a new contract for 2024. And then this could all be end up being water under the bridge. And it's not impossible for Becton to go out and play well this year. You know, you hope he stays healthy. And I think even Becton's biggest critic would admit that these injuries, there's been a lot of bad luck. And that's just something that, you know, on the offensive line, injuries happen, especially lower body injuries. You got all these people, you know, moving around, you know, bodies flying around. Um, unfortunately, injuries do happen on the offensive line. I, I just don't see where either side has the luxury of moving on right now because while Becton, you know, I think does have some potential still in there, there aren't a lot of teams that are necessarily going to want to bet on him. So even if, it, you know, if, some team suffers an injury in training camp. I mean, maybe you can get a team to take a flyer on Becton, but then you're opening up a hole for the Jets. And again, you're not getting much in return. So I think that this just needs to play itself out. If Becton plays really well, the Jets do have the franchise tag at their disposal. And if he doesn't play well, then, you know, it's kind of a moot point. But I don't think that the situation's necessarily gone beyond repair. I, I don't, I, I really have, don't get that impression at this point in time. Now, Becton's comments were critical, but. I still don't think it's necessarily the, the end of Becton with the Jets. We'll see how things play out. And you know what? Even if he's not happy with the Jets, that doesn't necessarily mean he's going to play poorly. You know, the guy playing quarterback for the Jets right now, Aaron Rodgers, two years ago, he was very unhappy with, I know he changed teams, but he was very unhappy with his team. It was clear that he, there was a lot of issues. He went out and won the MVP. So Becton could, even if Becton's not happy with the Jets, he could still play well. And that's the thing the Jets need. That's what they, I mean, I think if the Jets were, were, if you were to ask the Jets, they would tell you, we want this guy to go out and play very well. Now, head here on the Locked On Jets podcast, we'll continue our weekly mailbag. We'll talk about the cap situation. What's the next move the Jets will make? It depends, and I'll explain why as we continue on this Wednesday mailbag edition of the Locked On Jets podcast. Today's episode of Locked On Jets is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook. Make a fast break to FanDuel during the NBA playoffs. The finals are not quite set. Last night, Boston surprised many people by beating the Miami Heat in Game 4 in Miami, extending the series. It looked like they were finished after Game 3, but Boston at least stays alive for now. Now they're back at home for Game 5. The Heat are still favored, though. It's still probably going to be a Denver-Miami NBA Finals, but if you disagree with that, or if you want to put money down on the 
Eastern Conference Finals, you can go to FanDuel because right now new customers can get a no sweat first bet of up to $1,000. That's $1,000 back in bonus bets if your first bet does not win. There's no better place to get in all, all the playoff action than FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and get a no sweat first bet of up to $1,000. That's FanDuel.com slash locked on. FanDuel, official sports betting partner of the NBA. Thank you for making Locked On Jets your first listen or first watch every day. We continue with our weekly mailbag. And our next question, hey, John, can you give your thoughts on what sequence the following will happen? The reworking of Rodgers' contract, Quinn and Williams' contract extension, adding a few more players for depth and, and, and filling the remaining roster spots, maybe a Quan Alexander signing. We'll be signing the draft class. We'll be restructuring contracts. As we balance the cap, I'm assuming there will be some sort of domino effect and some de- decisions will happen before others. So the question is, what's going to happen next? Are they just going to try and clear a cap space out? Are they going to prioritize Quinton Williams? Are they going to prioritize Aaron Rodgers? Are they going to try and add a player or two like Aquan Alexander? And the answer is it depends. Now, the Jets do have a bit of cap space to play with, so they can make a couple moves. They could sign their draft picks. They could go out and get re-sign Aquan Alexander. They could also rework the Rodgers deal. Right now, Rodgers is slated to count about $1.1 million against the cap this year, but $107 million next year. You could probably figure out where that's heading. Most likely, some of that $107 million from 2024 is going to come back onto 2023. They'll reduce the 107, million, and that money will count towards this year. They could also make the they could also extend Quinn and Williams. Now, Quinn and Williams is interesting because it's conceivable Quinn and Williams' cap number for this year could go down if he signs a long-term extension. Now, if he gets a cap, if he gets like a signing bonus of say. $25 million or so, and that's you know roughly what I think the market value may be for a signing bonus. He gets the full $25 million up front, but the $25 million would not necessarily count against the cap this year. The In the NFL, the way it works is players get paid the signing bonus up front, but the cap hits for the signing bonus are spread over multiple years. So let's say it's a five-year contract with a $25 million signing bonus you get charged $5 million against the cap each year of the five-year deal. So it's $5 million this year, $5 million next year, five, five, five. Although, But again, the player gets, gets all the money up front. So if you're the Jets, you could say, well, we just gave you $25 million. Can you take a cheap, say, like $1 million salary for this year? They'd probably take it. And that's, one of, that's the reason you see a lot, of, a lot of the big contracts that are given out in the NFL have a very low cap hit in the first year. It's because the player gets a ton of the money up front in the form of signing bonus. And because he's already gotten paid so much money, he's willing to take a a cheap salary in the first year of the contract. However, the signing bonus, although it's paid to the player up front, counts against the cap evenly over the course of the deal. So all this is a long way of saying that Quinton Williams' cap hit of around $9 million could conceivably go down if he gets a long-term deal, which would free up a little bit of money. I don't think it's going to free up a lot of money for the Jets this year, but it could free up a little bit of money. But another factor in this is how much Aaron Rodgers is going to play for. You know, Aaron Rodgers currently slated $1.1 million against the cap this year, $107 million next year. We can presume a lot of that $107 million is coming back. I don't think Rodgers is going to play for $1.1 million. He may surprise us. He may just say, you know what, I've got enough money. I'm willing to... Play for play for something close to the league minimum. I you can't rule that out. Rodgers has surprised us before, but I'm assuming the number is going to go up. I would be surprised, however, if the number went above the 15 million he was originally supposed to make, or the 15 million he was originally supposed to count against the cap. Now, before he was traded to the Packers, the Packers had to restructure his contract so they wouldn't get hit with a lot of dead money. But originally, what the deal was was that Rodgers himself was supposed to get a 60 million dollar bonus. But only $15 million of that was supposed to count against the cap because, again, it's a bonus. So there were four years on his contract remaining. So essentially it was a $60 million bonus, and it would count against the cap in equal increments of $15 million over the next four years. I'd be surprised if the cap hit was higher than $15 million. And if it's lower than $15 million, then Jets can, Jets can do more. They could probably sign all their draft picks, and they could bring in a Quan Alexander. If it's $15 million, then they'll have to work on some more deals. You know, they'll have to restructure some more deals. So a lot of this comes down to how much Rodgers is going to make. But the timing of this, you know, it's up in the air. They could do anything right now because they do have a little bit of wiggle room against the cap. So I would not be surprised no matter what the Jets did. Although if Rodgers is making the full $15 million, or if Rodgers is making the full $60 million with a $15 million cap hit, then 
it might, you know, then they'll probably have to rework some deals to do everything. I hope that answered your question. Our next question, the law firm of Wilson, Boyle, and Strevler does little to stir any confidence should Rodgers go down for any period of time. What, if anything, would you do about the backup quarterback situation for this season? I'd like to upgrade it. And there are not a lot of great options out there, but there are some guys who I think would be upgrades over what the Jets have right now. I think Teddy Bridgewater, if he would be willing to come back to the Jets, you know, his situation was kind of interesting back in 2018 when they signed him and traded him before the season, but pretty much everybody who was a part of that is now gone. So, you know, I I don't know if Teddy Bridgewater has any frustration toward the Jets over how that played out, but anybody who was responsible for it's not here anymore. So you, maybe he'd be willing to come back. Uh, you know, Nick Foles, the, the the king of backup quarterbacks for this generation who won the Super Bowl, he's still available. So, I mean, not that these are great options. I think that the argument people make against investing in the backup quarterback position is that if Aaron Rodgers suffers like a season-ending injury, I don't want to say that, but if Aaron Rodgers suffers a serious injury that keeps him out for most of the season, then the Jets are finished anyway. That's true, but not every injury is a season-ending injury. You know, he suffered a, a, ca- a minor calf injury at the OTAs this week. So let's say this is the regular season right now. You know, he'll be fine by the start of the regular season. This injury should not impact him by September. But let's say he suffered a similar injury in, like, October or November. Maybe it's the type of thing that keeps him out one to two weeks. And, yeah, like, a Teddy Bridgewater or a Nick Foles is not going to save your season if they have to start 17 games. But in a situation where maybe Rodgers misses a week or two, having a competent backup quarterback could be the difference between a big win or a big loss that ends up either maybe winning you the division or losing you the division or helping you with your playoff seeding or hurting you with your playoff seeding, or maybe even the difference between making the playoffs or missing the playoffs. So I don't think you're signing like a veteran backup quarterback for the full season. I think what you're signing a veteran backup quarterback for is the situation where you need somebody to step in for a week or two. And I think with Zach Wilson, what you're looking at, you're looking at your new developmental quarterback and seeing how the end of last season played out when they benched Zach Wilson and then they had to put him back in because Mike White got hurt. I don't think that did Zach Wilson any favors. I think Zach Wilson, the goal should just be work on the practice field this year, try and develop, try and improve through the course of the season and not need to worry about preparing for a game, not need to worry about going up against the pressure of a game situation, the fan base turning on you. I think the best thing for Zach Wilson would be, would be to not play a snap this year. And the best way to ensure that ensure that would be to go out and get a better backup quarterback, make Zach Wilson your number three quarterback. Now, the NFL just changed its rules, so your number three quarterback can be essentially he can dress for the games and he's viewed as the he's essentially the emergency quarterback he does not count against your allotment of 47 to 48 players who you can activate for a game but he can go in if both of your both your starter and your backup get hurt which you hope wouldn't happen and usually wouldn't happen but in but most situations your number three quarterback's not really going to take a snap for you during the season and i think that zach wilson should be the number three quarterback for the jets this year, because again, what happened last year is after, you know, after he stepped out of the lineup, he had to go back in after Mike White got hurt. And it was kind of a perfect storm because originally the first couple of weeks when Wilson was benched, Joe Flacco was the starting quarterback. And then Flacco just had this brutal game where he had to play for an injured White in Buffalo. He looked unplayable. So the Jets essentially had no choice but to promote Zach Wilson to, to number two. And they became number one when Mike White couldn't play. It was just kind of kind of a bad situation all the way around, and he had a kind of an uneven game against Detroit, and then a disaster on Thursday night against Jacksonville. I think that showed you that Zach Wilson needs more work, and I don't think you want to put Zach Wilson on the field. It's yes, it's all it's about winning games, and yes, that game that another backup quarterback can play that could be the difference between the you know the Jets making the playoffs or missing the playoffs, or it could impact seeding or something like that. But more than anything, I think you just want Zach Wilson to work on the practice field because if you're going to salvage him. I don't know that putting him on the field this year is necessarily the best thing for his future development. Now, head you on the Locked On Jets podcast. We will close out our weekly mailbag show. We're going to talk about some players who could still interest the Jets. June is almost here. We're almost to to the post-June 1 cut season. Actually, it's already begun, and I'll explain that a little bit in a little bit more detail as we continue on this Wednesday mailbag edition of the Locked On Jets podcast. This is the Locked On Jets podcast here on this Wednesday. We're doing our weekly mailbag show. Our next question, are there any players on other teams that might get cut after June 1st who would be valuable additions for the Jets? That's a great question. So the answer is a little bit complex here. So 
you may or may not know this, but if a player is cut after June first, it can help the t- it can help the team that cuts him because what it does is it allows the team to stretch out the dead money cap hits over multiple seasons. So if you cut a player before June first, your dead money the dead money essentially all counts for your cap hit that season. But if you cut a player after June first, you can stretch that dead money out over multiple years. The way the NFL does it though is kind of interesting because. You actually don't have to wait till June 1st to make a player a June 1st cap hit. Essentially, you can cut a player and say, you know what, this guy's a June 1st cap hit. And what that does is if you just say that and you you can cut him at any point, you can cut him in March, you can cut him in April, you can cut him in May. If you just say this guy's a June 1st cap hit, then you can get the cap benefit. You can stretch out the dead money over the course of two seasons. The only the only caveat to it is that you can't access the caps, the cap space until June 1st. But players who are June post June 1st cap cuts a lot of them have already been cut because the team could just designate a player. This guy's our June 1st cap hit. We are stretching this money, the stretching this dead money hit out over two seasons. So with that in mind, uh, there's a guy I have in my, there's a guy I have my eye on. It's John Johnson, who has already been cut. He was already designated a post June 1st cap hit. He's a good safety. I think he's a guy who makes a lot of sense. I think that he he plays the deep part of the field. And that's what the Jets need in the safety right now. Because they have two guys who are better close to the line of scrimmage, Jordan Whitehead and Chuck Clark. And they're both decent players for that role. They don't really have a guy who's that good as a deep threat, though, as, as a deep safety. And today's NFL is shifting more and more towards two safeties deep, where you you don't play your safety so so close to the line of scrimmage anymore. It's essentially a mechanism to try and slow down opponent passing games and limit big plays because two safeties deep, it's difficult. When you have two guys playing the deep part of the field, it's more difficult to make big plays. When you have one safety deep, it's a little bit easier because you only have one guy to roam the entire field. There's a lot more space deep. I think John Johnson makes sense. He's already been a post-June 1st cap it, even though we're not in June yet. Another guy I have my eye on, he's a guy I've talked about a lot on the show over the last couple of months, and that's DeAndre Hopkins. There are all kinds of rumors that Arizona is going to move on from him. To me, he makes perfect sense for the Jets. You know, the Jets are an all-in win-now team, so you get a receiver in his 30s who still can make a big impact. You know, if you add him to a receiving group with Garrett Wilson, this looks really good. And I think that DeAndre Hopkins takes the Jets to a point where you can start to realistically say that this is a legitimate Super Bowl contender. And again, with 39, 40-year-old quarterback... You're built. You're you're trying to make it happen right now. You're not building anything for the future. You're trying to win a championship this year. So to me, that that's the guy that makes a lot of sense. A guy who makes a big impact. Guys, maybe closer to the end of his career, but you can work out a contract and structure it in a way with a low year one cap hit, and you just take your shot this year. And that's what the Jets are doing. So I think that if DeAndre Hopkins gets cut, and we don't know that whether he will be, but. There's been all kinds of buzz that the, the Cardinals just are not thrilled with this cap hit that they're going to have to take on for Hopkins. He's a guy I definitely have my eye on. And our last question, the conventional wisdom has been that Nathaniel Hackett was mostly a carrot to entice Aaron Rodgers, and there's been little, very little discussion about how the new coaches on offense will work together. What are your thoughts on the arrival of Hackett, Todd Downing, and Keith Carter? Downing seemed like an odd hire, given that Hackett seems way more qualified to run a passing game than Downing, and I assume that Hackett will be calling the plays. Well, I think if the Jets did not get Aaron Rodgers, my answer to this question would be different, but this is going to be Aaron Rodgers' offense. Rodgers is going to run the show on offense, and you know, if you get a Hall of Fame quarterback, you let him do what he wants. I, I think that the coaching role is would be very different in a world where maybe the Jets were sticking with Zach Wilson for another year, or even if they went in a different direction, if they went with a lower profile quarterback. Nathaniel Hackett has a reputation for being like the ultimate players coach. And that got him into a little bit of trouble in Denver where maybe he took it a little bit too far. Maybe it was not a team or maybe Russell Wilson was not the type of quarterback who he wanted to give that much leeway to. And it created a lot of problems. But we've seen Hackett and Rodgers work well together. Uh, Rodgers obviously likes Hackett. And I think a lot of it goes back to Hackett strikes me as a guy who's very hands off, especially when he's got an established quarterback like Rodgers. And again, I think there's a logic to it. You know, if you've got a guy who's that great, you ask him, what do you want to do? It is a player's league. Something I said, and folks, every day, or folks who listen to the podcast every day know this. I said this for months after Mike LaFleur was, was gone, after the Jets got rid of their old offensive coordinator, that the success of the 2023 Jets was going to depend way more on the quarterback they got than the offensive coordinator they got. And with Aaron Rodgers, you've got a guy who's, I'm sure Hackett 
is a good sounding board for him. I'm sure Hackett knows the types of plays Rodgers wants to run. I'm sure Hackett understands how to put Rodgers in situations he's comfortable with. But at the end of the day, this is going to be Aaron Rodgers' offense. I, I don't think the coaches are going to have that big of an impact. And I think that maybe when they hired Downing, there was a point where they weren't sure they were getting Rodgers, so they were kind of preparing for life without Rodgers. You know, they had to make plans for another quarterback. But with Aaron Rodgers in, in the mix, I just don't think the coaches are going to matter as much as they would in another scenario. Anyway, that's all for today's episode. This has been the Locked On Jets podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day is our motto. As always, if you enjoyed the show, hit the subscribe button where you're watching or listening so that you'll never miss an episode. Please give the show a five-star review if you're listening on a podcast source or a big thumbs up if you're watching on YouTube. These things help us out. Help other Jets fans find Locked On Jets. Have a great Wednesday, everybody. We'll be back tomorrow to talk more Jets.